Hey, what is going on, everybody? Welcome to Super Lunch Bros Podcast, episode number 95. I am Brendan. Up and down. I mean, uh, I guess <laughs> uh, there was some really exciting stuff. Probably uh, fight of the, I'd probably say fight of the year contender. Um, being uh, Figueredo and Moreno. Uh, that we're, t- of course, talking. going to talk about UFC 270. Uh, we had Francis Gahn taking on uh, the current... He's the interim champ taking on the champ. Francis Ngannou. Uh, we had some more fun fights uh, in Michelle Pereira, uh, Sa- Saeed Nurmagomedov, and there was another. Uh, there was a couple other good fights on the card. And we'll go over all those, um, and we'll go over some scoring and whether or not I agree with them. Spoiler alert: I don't. I don't. <laughs> Okay, uh, before we do get started with that stuff, please, if you could take the time, if you do like these things, if you do like me talking about the UFC, if you like hearing about the UFC, if you like talking about MMA and hearing about the random crap that I talk about, please like and subscribe. I would appreciate it a lot. It means a lot to me. Um, please comment down below. Let me know what you thought about the fights. Let me know how you scored everything. Did you agree with the judging? Did you agree with the refing? All that stuff, please. The more comments, the better. I love responding. I love talking about MMA. Uh, on Twitter at... Uh, um, bros underscore lunch please you know hit me up on twitter anything you want we'll just talk about mma all day i love doing it i really do i try to keep it positive i try not to be negative i'm not i'm obviously i'm human of course i have negative thoughts and like I, sometimes i'm pessimistic and stuff but i try to be as positive as possible because i uh i noticed that the comment section in a lot of uh or the the uh responses to a lot of tweets tend to be heavily skewed towards the negative when it comes to MMA. I don't know why. It's not it's not cool. It's not fun. But uh let's let's get into some of the fights. Okay, we had Francis Ngannou taking on the challenger <coughs> Cyril Gan. Uh of course, let's let's I'll do the voice again. The former teammates. He knocked him out in training. Francis Ngannou did. He said it was an accident. He feels bad about it. Like this whole lead up and th- thing, like it's, it was natural and I appreciated it. I did. I liked their play off of each other. I felt like this, like they don't hate each other. They just know that, hey, we're opponents and we don't have to be best friends right now. We were never really best friends. We were, we trained in the same place. We happen to be heavyweights and we're, you know, I went to France and to train. It is what it is. What I don't like about it is the media coverage trying to spin and twist and that asinine uh media member asking questions of francis trying to get like saying like oh this guy's an easy com-. dude shut up all this way overplayed didn't like it before we get into it this fight sucked okay and i have uh, a sneaking suspicion that a lot of You like it or not, guys, this might be the Francis Ngannou fight style. Okay, look what happened against Derek Lewis. We all we all laughed it off and said, "Oh, he's changed, and oh, it's different." And look, he's back to knocking people out. But how much has really changed? Let's let's, let's talk about that afterwards. Okay, so let's go. Just break it down round by round. We can go over this fight really quick because not a lot happened. Uh, I mean, I can pull up some stats for you. There was nothing, like, really not a lot happened, and most of it happened early on. So in the first round, we had Gon with decent movement, and he was doing a little bit of clinch work. He did okay in that. Uh, Francis did some uh, big swings, misses. He realized, oh, I'm not going to be able to get this guy out of here by swinging like that, so he kind of knocked it off. And Gon outlanded him 15 to 12 it's and he was much more efficient as you can see here he landed 75 percent of his uh, significant strikes i mean uh, we've been over this efficiency only matters if you outland your opponent and you uh, do more damage okay because uh, efficiency and as, as far as far as fighting as far as stats go right it's a good thing to be efficient with your striking it generally means you will fatigue less often and less quickly because you are uh, less wasteful with your punches. You're more likely to knock out your opponent. Right. It's good to be more accurate with your strikes. But when it comes to scoring, okay, like I just want to be very clear when I'm saying this because I don't want this taken out of context 
and someone saying like, oh, you're saying being accurate with your punches is a bad thing? No. <laughs> but when it comes to scoring, I've said this a bunch of times, accuracy means nothing. It's about damage. And if damage is equal, the guy who was less accurate probably threw more than you <laughs> if damage is equal, right? If damage is equal, striking numbers are equal as far as landed strikes, but you were more efficient than your opponent, that means he was pressing the action and throwing more. That counts as offense. Now, you can negate that by having forward pressure, right? But that's that's a feather in his cap, right? That is a, a stat that he he takes from you, the aggression due to throwing more strikes in you. I know it seems counterintuitive, but just think about it, right? Like, let's say I'm more efficient than you, and we're, we're fighting, right? And I throw 10 strikes at you, and I land all 10, okay? And they hit with X amount of power, okay? You hit me with 10 shots, and they each land with X amount of power. So we have landed the exact same amount, and we have uh, exact with the exact same amount of power, right? And the exact same amount of damage has been uh, applied to the opponent. Let's say you threw 30. I only threw 10. You threw 20 more than I did, which means you were only one third. You only landed one third of your shots. I was 100% efficient with my shots. I'm super good. You threw 20 more shots than I did. Do you understand how significant that is as far as in the eyes of the judges, period, but also in scoring as far as aggression and trying to finish the fight? I tried to hit you 10 times and I hit you all of those 10. You tried to hit me 30. You tried to hit me 30 times, and that does count for something when all other things are equal. Okay. That being said, Ciro Gan did outland him in the first. I just wanted to bring that up because, I don't know, it. it I, I, I don't know, it, because Francis was less efficient, but I wasn't trying to say that that meant anything. Okay. Uh, if, the first round easy easily goes to Gan 10-9. Second round, more of the same from the first. Uh, Gan did a little bit job, a better job managing distance for this one, uh, keeping it at kickboxing range, uh, picking his shots, doing pretty much everything he wanted. 2018, Gan. Then in the third round, we have what I consider the downfall of the heavyweight division. And that's when... Someone has to do something that's out of their element, and it's so out of their element that they don't know what to do when they get there. But unlike in other divisions, where it usually doesn't happen at the championship level, <laughs> maybe it does. Maybe I'm being hard, too harsh on the heavyweights, but generally speaking, the heavyweights are less skilled. It's just, it is. Okay, there we don't need to have a long discussion or an argument about it. It's just a numbers game, okay? What the number of men that are that large, the number of men that are that large that are that that are athletic, the number of men that are that large, athletic, and also choose to do MMA and not go and seek other ventures which are much more profitable. Okay, and now you're left with that small pool of people, and then you have to split them up amongst all the all of MMA, right? And I understand that, you know, the UFC is the premier uh, organization, but there are, are good heavyweights outside of the UFC. So now you have to thin out the, he the already thin heavyweight division. You don't end up with the best of the best as far as athletic, um, uh, athletic individuals, right? So if you would have taken guys who are, you know, D1 football players, guys who are, you know, crazy, uh, just g genetic freaks in basketball. Uh, you got guys who are, uh, I, I, I would say strongman competitors, but I don't think they're, that translates super well. Some of the power lift, some of the, uh, like, Olympic lifters who are super athletic. That's what I'm saying is, like, each one of them could, or it's the wrestlers who just strictly do wrestling, each one of them, has a strong base for athleticism when it comes to their, you know, given sport, but that's already such a small pool of individuals anyway. And now you're going to thin that pool out even more by divvying up the sports. And then you're going to give them less incentive to come do MMA.
because of the money, which was a huge thing. Like the payouts were abysmal for this because not a lot of veterans and uh, not a lot of drawing power. I mean, I'm not on the side of fighters getting paid less, okay? I'm not. Sorry if I'm a little tired, by the way. This is a late one for me, guys. <laughs> I uh, drove up to uh, drove up to Wisconsin. Um, my youngest daughter had a swim meet up there. Also, it snowed last night, so, you know, shoveled. Well, my neighbor very kindly let me borrow a snowblower, but I did some shoveling. My wife and the girls were out there helping me shovel. It's just been, it's just been a long day. So, sorry if I'm a little... Uh, less enthusiastic than I, I, I usually am. So in this third round, Francis, <laughs> I wrote in my notes. I was being very cynical when I wrote this because I hate when I'm fed a narrative and that narrative completely falls apart. Like I hate it. I, I, I hate it. So I wrote, Mr. Big Power starts to panic wrestle. <laughs> So Gan throws a front kick, and then uh, Nganu, you know, I would say skillfully catches the kick and then uh, dumps him on the ground. Nothing wrong with that. But then on top, Nganu lands almost nothing. Gan works his way back up and then gets taken down, you know, with like 30 seconds or 45 seconds left in the round or whatever. And nobody landed any damage in the third round. And if you look at the totals here, 9 to 6. Okay, not a lot of damage. But clearly Gon's, though. Or, sorry, clearly in Ganus. So, 29-28 at this point. Fourth round plays out just like the third. Okay? <laughs> Again, more cynical. Guys who can't grapple, grappling. <laughs> it's so frustrating to watch that crap. Also, Saul Diamato, you're wrong. You're absolutely wrong. <laughs> you're wrong. <laughs> uh... In this round, the fourth round was very, very similar. Almost no damage. Um, Gan did throw out more strikes, but he like he didn't really do a lot of damage in this round. And, and Gan was spent the entire round on top or whatever. It was a boring round, not great, whatever. Now, here's the four, the four, the fifth round is the key here, and we're gonna look at this control time of two fifty one for Gan. It's very important. Keep that in mind. In the fifth round, Gan manages to get on top. Okay, pretty early on. I think at like uh, at the four minute mark. Yep, that's what I wrote down. So at the four minute mark, Gan lands on, gets on top. And then there's not a really a scramble because I don't think Ngannou was trying to work to a work to an elbow and work to a hip and try to escape. So he's doing the right things. I'm not criticizing his uh, ground game as far as that goes, as far as escaping or getting back to a better position. But, by the way, fifth round, seven to five in favor of Gan. Seven to five. Uh, and that also plays a role here. So, in this fifth round, we have Gan staying on top, then rolling around a little bit, Gan diving on a knee, and then diving for a heel hook. He gets the heel hook locked in, but it's his legs are... Uh, above the knee of Nganu, so Nganu wasn't able to, or Nganu was able to relieve the pressure and kind of get his leg out. That process of two, I think it was uh, two total submission attempts. Um, okay, it says three there, but so maybe three submission uh, total submission attempts over two minutes of control, or no, sorry, a minute and a half of control time uh, on top and on the ground. And then Francis switches over and then gets on top and then proceeds to lay on him for the rest of the round. Two and a half minutes. The first part of the round was Gans. Pretty easily. He was trying to finish the fight. And Gans switches, lays on top, and rides out on... In Yeah, he won the second half. Okay. So he won the second half of that round but 
given the round as a whole, which is how we're supposed to judge it, because the last minute of the round is not more important than the first minute of the round, regardless of your feelings and emotions. Feelings don't matter. Okay, it doesn't matter if you feel like it's more important because he came back from a deficit. Okay, it's about damage. I say this all the time. It's about damage first. Who's trying to finish the fight? Nganu was not trying to finish the fight in the fifth round. He was not. And, but, sorry, not and, but, if he had gotten on top earlier in that round and Gan had not done any damage nor tried to finish the fight, then easily goes to Nganu. Retains the belt, happy, everybody applauds, although they shouldn't, bad fight. In this scenario, I would not be mad if someone scored that fifth round for Gan. I just wouldn't. Hey, think, think about that, though. Like, Take your emotions out of it. Take your bias out of it. Take your favorite fighter out of your mind, or whoever you prefer out of these two guys. And reverse the order of those things happening. Okay? Fighter A... Let, yeah, let's do this. Let's say Fighter A sits on top for two and a half minutes of the first... Or, uh, for two, the first two and a half minutes of a round. Fighter B gets on top after two and a half minutes and attempts a, couple, uh, attempts a few submissions, and then the round ends in a neutral way. Who wins that round? I would say Fighter B, which I don't know if I said Fighter B. I think I might have just said Fighter A. God dang it, my brain's not working. That's exactly what happened in reverse. And I just explained that the order in which events happen in a round are not significant. Okay? Minute one is equal to minute five. Second one is equal to the last second of the round. Okay? Second 350. No, second 300. Idiot. There's, there's a good argument that Gon won this fight. It's not going to make MMA fans happy because this fight was garbage, and people don't like seeing belts change hands uh, when there's no action. And then this whole, oh yeah, by the way, this whole thing where Dana White didn't put the belt around Nganu, it's not the first time he's done it, it won't be the last. Who gives a shit? I don't care. I've, I've talked about this for the past three years now. Uh, two and a half years at least. About Nganu and his uh, qualms with the UFC, his management, the handling of this situation, and how I feel he has not done a very good job. I don't think his management has done a good job. And I think if he could have played this a lot better and made a change for every, as more as many people as possible instead of just trying to make more money for himself uh, not that i necessarily think that's what he was like he wasn't thinking like oh i'm all in this for me and i don't care about anybody else it's just you know he deserve he deserves more money and he wants it there's nothing wrong with that i feel like there was a better way to do it a better way to resolve it and i think it could have helped a lot of fighters along the way without becoming a dc right you know where he just toes the company line Anyway, this was a terrible fight. Uh, what's What are the takeaways here? Is Gan garbage? Fuck no, he's not. Gan is great. Is Nganu garbage? No. Has he improved? Yes. Let's let's finish with Gan first. Uh, do I think Gan will be UFC champion at some point? Hard to say. Uh, the gut reaction and my knee-jerk reaction is yes. Based off his skill, the way he's taken. But it's heavyweight, man. This could be his only time ever even sniffing uh, a real belt. 
he might get knocked out or shut out by three guys and be out of the UFC in a year and a half. You might think, I'd like, that's not crazy. What I just said is not crazy. Could happen. Uh, do I think that's that's not the most likely scenario, though? I think he probably beats uh, either two contenders or beats a contender and gets another title shot, depending on who has the belt, if Francis is still here, if Francis leaves. Um, there's a lot, a lot that needs to be figured out before we know what's happening with Gon. I would not might mind Gon taking on Stipe. I think that'd be a fun fight. Although I'd want to see Stipe in freaking Blades first. Just once. What about Nganu? Uh, I think he's improved. I think he, he's much more disciplined. I think that showed in his ability to last the whole fight without being completely gassed. I think it showed in his uh, willingness to change his game uh, going into the third. I, 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 listen, I might have been glib by saying, oh, Mr. Mr. Big Power is going for panic takedowns. I understand that. Uh, it's, you know, he took the path of least resistance. He found an easy, easy a thing he could do easily, and then he just did it. Uh, you can't be mad at him for that. I'm not. I'm not mad at him for finding a way to win. You know, as a paying customer, I would like to see more action. And if I was a newbie to the UFC or had I brought someone over to my house, you know, people use this example all the time. Where they're like, oh, I brought my friend over. He had, I told them that the hardest hitting guy in the world was going to fight. And then they watched this garbage. You know, you, you got to set him up with more context than that. Like shit happens. Plus the fight beforehand it, more than made up for this one. Um, what else did we see from Nganu? Still has cardio issues. I don't know if that's something that's ever going to be resolved. Uh, I mean, he's not super young. He's not super old. I think he's like 30, 33. How old is he? Oh, no, he's 35. Yeah. He's 35. So, uh, I mean, he's still in his prime for a heavyweight. I don't think he's uh, physically going to fall off uh, fall off a cliff anytime soon. But as far as skill-wise go, how much more advancement do I think he's going to do? I think his advancement has been overblown by his supporters. Um, I, I think, you know, he has he is clearly advanced. Don't get it twisted. And I think he's got a lot of that newbie. Uh, over the past five, six years, I think he's had a lot of those new, what we call in the... Uh, uh, lifting world newbie gains where you know when you first start working out your muscles are going to grow at a rate that you no one will ever see ever again because it's your body's uh reaction to the first stressor the, the stressors that they've never felt before you're going to get increased muscle mass decrease in fat like it's incredible and it's kind of same thing when it comes to skill acquisition you know, looking at Francis when he first came in compared to now, it's leaps and bounds. He looks like a completely different fighter. But look at him compared to his contemporaries in other weight classes. And do you think he's a well-rounded fighter who could manage to, if he was a different weight, manage to compete with the best in the world in any other weight class? I mean, maybe light heavyweight, but I don't think he could. I mean, the power... But the, these other divisions are loaded with guys who know how to handle that. So there's a there's still there's still room for him to move up. There's still uh, advanced things that he can work on. I don't I don't know if cardio is one of them. To be honest with you, just it's genetics, it's physics, it's uh, a lot of things. It's you know I, I don't know if cardio is one of those things you can fix. Now I think he, you can manage your cardio better, and I think he did a pretty good job in this fight. To be honest with you, I really do. I think that was the reason he did come away with his hand raised is because he didn't blow out all of his energy in that first and second round, and he managed to coast. Uh, he he was exhausted though. Uh, his wrestling has improved in that he can do it now. Um, his grappling has improved as in he can do it now. His uh, submission game is non-existent or we didn't see any um but there's nothing wrong his ground and pound again non-existent uh, you know his ground and pound has always come from big knockdowns and then he's basically hitting a corpse on the ground you know we can all throw some decent ground and pound when there's a dead possum sitting in your yard and you have a shovel 
we can all do some decent ground pound. <laughs> okay, uh, it takes uh, it does take some skill, actually a lot of skill, to do effective ground and pound um, by you know posturing up, uh, maintaining your opponent's position, generating power from certain positions, finding openings, working with your opponent. It, there's a, there's a lot that goes into it. You know, it's not just throw your fist as hard as you can at uh, at a sack of meat. So. Um, I, this is not a great win. I'm not going to congratulate Nganu on barely eking out a win against an opponent like this. I think the fight could have been a lot better. I think Gan really blew blew his uh, chance here. He he had many opportunities, especially in that fifth round where he could have just sat on top and he could have been the guy who just rode out to the victory. So uh, there was this was not a good fight. This was not a good fight, and it's not a good way to end your. Uh, end your contract. This does not give you a lot of uh, negotiating power to come into the table. I don't think this increases his draw. I don't think this increases his popularity. Um, and for the record, I don't, I don't hate Nganu. I like him a lot. I love his story. And it, it, like as an inv- individual, he's extremely likable. <laughs> he's, how do you not like Nganu? A guy who can go in there and kill someone with a punch, but then also like wants to go hang out in Cameroon with his in, with his mom sitting in a hut, you know. A guy who came from sand mines, like it's just this guy is a freaking uh, one of a kind, genuine individual, and you can't help but feel good for him when he gets these wins, and you feel bad for him when he's being dicked over by the UFC. But that doesn't make you a draw. Okay, that's a different that's a different animal. Okay. Getting people to pay to watch you fight is different than people liking you. People don't have to like you to pay to watch you fight. Look at Floyd Mayweather. You pay to watch him lose. You pay to watch him win. Doesn't matter. You paid. Not a lot of people are paying to watch Francis Ngannou lose. And to be honest, not a lot of people are paying to watch him win either. He's just not as big of a draw as he could be. And part of that could be because of the promotional power of the UFC trying to maybe minimize his potential because they don't want to pay him. So, you know, that's not all on Nganu, but, you know, you got to make your own then. I wouldn't be mad if he left the UFC and went somewhere else. Go get your money. Uh, go somewhere else and open up the UFC's heavyweight division again and, you know, and keep the talks open because then there's like, you know, you ended the ended the reign on top. Like you left as champ and that's a, that does say a lot. Okay. Let's move on to a fucking banger. Holy moly. Figueiredo versus uh, Davison Figueiredo versus uh, Brandon Moreno. The trilogy, the third fight. Uh, the first fight was a draw. Second fight, Moreno won. And this fight, I'll go over scoring. So, uh, it was an excellent fight, by the way. This, uh, my pick for uh, this this has my pick for a fight of the... Well, maybe not. I don't know, man. We've only had two cards, and there's already been two two fights that are fight of the year contenders. Just look at the outputs on this, okay? 105 to 86 as far as just significant strikes. Total strikes. 106 to 95. Okay, fine. Look at the totals. 260 to 178. That's a total attempt. Just so much volume from these guys. Okay. Uh, Figgy in the first round kind of was stalling for a second when he had Moreno pushed up against the, uh, the cage in the clinch. Uh, he stalled for like 45 seconds. I, I, I guess he was kind of working for a takedown, couldn't get it. It was weird. Uh, Figgy had a... Uh, Figueroa had uh, a, like a heavy... Low kick offense early going in the early goings. Uh, he kept it going throughout the whole fight too. Um, Moreno ended up buckle. He kind of uh, he he buckled Figueiredo with a right hand after he was knocked off balance uh, during an exchange. Uh, the first round though, I, it was close because of that wobble. But again, look at the damage that Figueiredo did. Just go back and watch that first round. It's pretty pretty easily Figueiredo's. Second round, more volume coming from Moreno in the second round. Quite a bit more, a little bit more uh, from Figueiredo, but not not as much as Moreno. Um, 
big shots from Brandon. Uh, stunning Figueroa twice in that second round. And because of that, you know, Figgy was wobbled and outlanded. Hard not to give that second round to Moreno. So we are at 19-19, all tied up going into the third. Third round. So here's here's where it gets interesting. So Moreno rushes Figgy early and gets taken down. Nothing doing, no damage. It was like uh, not really controlling the ground either. It was more like five seconds of like scrambling around and then Moreno gets back up. So maybe 10 seconds. Uh, no control, no damage. Uh, that's that's a nothing unless there was a tie in the round, which there was not, as far as all the other statistics go. So Figgy caught Moreno and looked to stumble him, and then so he 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 caught him with a good shot, but then F- Figueroa got st- stumbled himself multiple times. So the commentary c- team kept making a big deal out of Figueroa's leg kicks. But, like, as they're doing it, Moreno lands a big right hand and uh, wobbled Figueroa. So there were big shots from Figueroa in this round, to, especially to end the third. There was that big shot to put Moreno on his butt, but there was no dam- like there was no follow-up damage. He went for a submission that wasn't there. Uh, Moreno wasn't out of it. He was, he was sat down, but he immediately got back up. Uh, it was working his way back up. You know, he wasn't out-out. Um, and despite that being a big a big last shot, Moreno did more damage in the third round, both in total strikes and if you want to go, like, he wobbled him multiple times. You know? I, I had it going. I have it 29-28 Moreno, okay? Uh, he outlanded, did more damage, and yeah, like, I've already explained this. It's very important to understand the scoring system. Take your emotions out of it, okay? Take your bias out of it. The last 10 seconds of a round are no more important than the first 10 seconds of a round, regardless of your feelings. That is not how the scoring system works in the UFC. It does not work like that. This is not pride. It's not that. It's, this, is a, this is supposed to be, I punch you once, I punch you it, when the, in the start of the round, you punch me at the end of the round. That should be a tie. Okay, not, none of these arguments like, well, you all the stuff you did earlier in the round did obviously wasn't enough. So my punch means more at the end. No, because if I if I knew that if I knew the round wasn't going to be ending, maybe I wouldn't have thrown all those things. That's why we have to have an even scoring system, because we have set out these rules. We know that it's five minutes long. So to say that, oh, you know, he he landed that shot with four, with one second left. He, so all all that damage did nothing to him. No, it did. It added up. There was damage, and Moreno did more damage. He just did. Moreno did more damage. He wins round three. Uh, Moreno's leg was compromised in the fourth round. You could kind of tell his uh, management or his uh, he managed well, but his movement was a little bit off. Uh, both men slowed down their output quite a bit in uh, well. So in the third, I didn't say uh, he Moreno outlanded. Figure away to 26 to 19. Then the fourth round, it goes down to 20 to 15, also in favor of Moreno. But both men slowed down. Figgy look, uh, looking kind of desperate to keep the clinch because he looked tired. But I think Figueredo did more damage in the fourth round, even though he was outlanded. I think he did more uh, big shots. Uh, I wouldn't be mad if he gave that to Moreno, but I lean towards Davison for that one. Again, I wouldn't be mad because that, that round was... Uh, there was a lot of exchanges. I might have to go back to watch round four again, but I, I'm not mad giving that round to Figueroa. All right. In the fifth round, Moreno starts with a he starts the fifth round with a takedown. Gets no damage, no control, no nothing. So it's for this is this means nothing. Figueroa got a knockdown at two ten. I don't think that was enough to give him this round. Moreno outlanded him again. And in the last exchange, okay, I'm not saying the last exchange meant more than the knockdown, but he did a lot of damage throughout the round. And with that last exchange where he did, he hurt Davison in the last exchange. Okay, yeah, Davison didn't fall down, but he wobbled him multiple times and he outlanded him in the final round. 
I, I gave the final round to Moreno. Now, I am biased. Like I think I like Moreno more than Figueiredo. Not I think. I know I like Moreno more than Figueiredo, so I might not be able to score this one objectively. But for sure, my the logic the logic I have laid out for round three is undeniable. I, I, uh, I you could try and convince me, but you'd have to lay out a rock solid argument. And we'd have to go strike for strike on round three, and you could tell me why you think Figueiredo should have got that round because of one take one knockdown at the end of the round, in which he was outlanded, out damaged throughout the whole round. So I don't want to hear that one. Uh, round four, I could be argued either way. I actually picked that for Davison. Okay. And uh, the fifth round, uh, again, like maybe you can you could convince me that that was Figueiredo's. I wouldn't be mad, um, but I just think Moreno did more damage. I think Moreno should have got the nod on this one. I really do. I think the uh, judges, I think the judges got this one wrong. It's it wasn't. It's not a it's not a robbery by any means. Even if if Moreno would have got it and people are calling it a robbery, that's horseshit. It's not a robbery. There were some close rounds. Uh, this is where subjectivity does come into play. Uh, there are, with the way the rule set is laid out in MMA and the scoring criteria is laid out in MMA, you and I can watch the exact same fight in the exact same round and be following the scoring criteria to the T and come up with a different result. It's just the way it is. So I'm not mad, right? Uh, this is not a uh, injustice, a grave injustice that has done to the assassin baby here. It's it's more of just unfortunate that this is how it had to work out. Uh, Figueredo called for a fourth fight going down to Mexico. Maybe let's pump the brakes. Uh, I do enjoy watching these guys fight. They do seem like they were meant to fight each other constantly, and I'm totally in flavor of them uh, fighting for a fourth time. But if we're going to keep this division around, you know, with the way it's been going, we got to have somebody else throw their name in there. Because right now, right now, without name, without thinking, don't look it up. Name another flyweight. Who's a contender? Don't look up the record. Don't look up the records of the rankings. Tell me another contender. I can name two. I can name two. Askar Askarov and Kaikara France. Okay. That's it. <laughs> it's, I think, Kai Car France and Kai Car, and Askar Askarov. Oh boy, I hope I'm not wrong. Yeah. Oh, Brandon Roy Vault. Uh, yeah, Alexander Pantoja. That guy. See, there's a, there's a lot of guys out there who need need their title shots. Okay, I have seen this enough for right now. Right, I've. I mean, I'm not. I'm not over this. I think it's a great, uh, a great trilogy. A quad, it could be the f- the first quadrilogy, and it could happen right now, uh, justifiably so, because the first fight was a draw. And that's understandable, totally fair. Uh, it's warranted. It's great. There's, I'm not. You're never going to hear me argue against that. Uh, the merit of that fight, on its own. Uh, in its own universe, I guess you could say. But we don't it doesn't exist in a vacuum. Okay, we have other fighters that need to get their time. They need to get they deserve to get a title shot. We can't just have them fighting each other with no opportunity for the belt for multiple years because the UFC doesn't know if they're keeping this division. Right? Uh we lost the greatest flyweight of all time to one FC and Demetrius Maidamash Johnson. Uh, he just, he was, I don't, he never, he never lost the belt. Henry Cejudo, that, he did not lose a, that belt to Henry Cejudo. Uh, judges didn't know what the hell they were scoring in that shit, so. That was, that was a robbery. <sighs> All right. Fun fight. Uh, oh, also. Mm, who's that guy? Oh, yeah, that fucking manager, you know, the one who looks like a goddamn gremlin. Yeah, he can go fall off a fucking cliff. Fuck that guy. Dude, he's a scum bucket. He's always trying to weasel his way in there and say things for him. He's done it. He did it for Figueredo before, and then Rogan had to, like, or not Rogan, maybe it was Bisping, had to back him off and be like, no, 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 what, what did Davison say? I'm not interested in what you're saying because I don't know Portuguese, but I know that you two didn't say the same words. So what the fuck is he saying? Get away. And I'm glad they had a translator in, this, in there this time. Uh, you know, his face, dude, he looks like a scumbag. He's got that face where you're like, 
oh, he's up to something. It's it was it's gross. I can't stand that shit. I, I you know, everybody who he's involved with seems uh, it doesn't it doesn't seem right. Plus, he owns the art. I think I think he's part of the promotion of Jungle Fight, and he has to do with like the governmental body down there, and his fighters are all juiced up. I don't know. I watched a video on that. Anyway. Uh, here's a fun fight. Uh, Michelle Pereira versus Andre uh, Fialo. What a fight. This one was good. Lots of output, especially from one side here. First round, uh, Fialo, uh, had a ton of pressure. Kept, uh, keeping Michelle, uh, past the racetrack, like, against the fence. And he was able to land with, a just a one-two pretty consistently and busted up Michelle's nose, and the only thing Michelle Pereira was able to do was land his front kick. The uh, Fiello ended up on top. Andre ended up on top of that in that first round due to a slip. And, I mean, he got it 10-9. Good job. Stepping up on short notice to fight uh, Michelle Pereira. The fun fight. And he did a great job. And this is where <laughs> it didn't go so well for him after that. I, mean, I see he still was competitive, right? He wasn't totally out of it. But if you look at the striking numbers, the first round, um, Andre didn't land as much in the first round, but I pretty pretty clearly his. Uh, he was down uh, 17 to 12. But in the second round, this is where uh, Michelle just started throwing volume, man. 47 to 16. Michelle mixed it up. He was so he was mixing up so much better, starting with the low kicks, the inside and the outside uh, jabs to the body. And then he threw a big right uh, overhand right multiple times and stunned him. Uh, dude, he he opened he was opening up, just unloading a variety of shots, great combos, and then the, those teep kicks to the body. Oh, so good. He was digging the toes in. I think he hurt him at one point because Fialo started backing up. Uh, he wasn't dead in the water, but he was definitely hurt and tired uh, ending up ending that second round. 19-19, not a bad one. Um and then Michelle like has this great combo where he throws a front kick. Okay, he throws it up the middle, throws the front kick, then he throws a right hand and then a low kick. Uh, it was it landed over and over again. I think I I count I started counting it after I saw it a few times, and I think I counted it like three times, and that was in the third round. Uh, it's incre- it such a fun combo to watch. It's just the guys the guys awesome. Um. 30 seconds left, and Michelle caught him uh, with a nut shot with uh, while he was throwing a front kick. <sighs> Again, showing his undisciplined side a little bit, but this one, you know, you got to own your tools. I'm not forgiving him uh, based off of how I've been in this in the past. I think you should take a point for that, and then, therefore, this is a draw. Uh, it would be unfortunate, but it is what it is. Uh, obviously, that didn't happen. He d- got a warning, and then things moved on. 29, 28. Michelle, I told you. I told you this was late for me. Normally, I don't record this late. Okay. Ooh. Cody Stamen. Oh, here. I want to I wanna talk about this one real quick. So, remember, before this weekend, he, he was supposed to fight uh, Muslim Salikov. Uh, Michelle Pereira was that way. That is. All right. So he was supposed to fight the number 15 guy, which means he's basically, he's probably ranked like number 16 or number 17. Uh, this After this weekend, I wouldn't be surprised if either he takes the fit number 15 spot because Muslim uh, didn't uh, didn't step up or if they reschedule this fight and they fight again. He has some holes in his game still, okay? Uh, P- Pereira still has some holes in his game. But I remain... <clears throat> confident in what I said before this weekend. Him versus Kamzat Chemaev. Why not? I think it's fun. Okay? You got Kamzat ch- ch- challenging everybody, wanting all this stuff, wanting to fight Kamara Usman. You got a guy who's fun and all action. Right? If it doesn't go if it doesn't go very long, Kamzat just manages to lift him up and finish him within five minutes like he did against Li Jing, uh, Jing Liang, then fine. You got another one for the highlight reel. If it's a longer fight and they have some fun interactions, you got Michelle Pereira, so you know there's going to be creative. Dude, that, that's a banger. Throw it out there. I don't give a shit. Uh, 
if not, you know, him fighting Santiago Ponzinibbio, that's not fair. Uh, have him fight Jeff Neal. Um, he could fight Jing Liang. Michael Kies is a bit of a leap. I think that's that's it. I don't I don't want him fighting anybody else. I don't want him fighting anybody in the top ten. Do 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 do. All right, Cody Stamen versus uh, Saeed Nurmagomedov. You want to look at the striking totals? Count them. Seven to one. Okay, cool. Now let's go back. <laughs> Dude, uh, Saeed looks fucking huge for this weight class. He is big for a bantamweight. How tall is he? Five foot eight. He just and he's got like a seventy inch reach. He's the dude's my height. He's got shorter arm, a little bit shorter arms than I do, but he's he's big for a bantamweight man. Um, also, he holds his weight like a, a freaking wrestler does too. So, oof, he's gonna be he's gonna be a problem. Uh, Stamen put pressure on him early on, but uh, Saeed reversed it and got the power guillotine and finish it within. I mean, what was the finish time? Forty seven seconds. Yeah. Like right at the beginning of the fight. Okay, uh, Michael Morales versus Trevin Giles. Uh, this fight was fun while it lasted. Uh, Giles started with uh, some hard leg kicks and stunned stunned Morales early on, but uh, Giles got really reckless and ran ran into a, a Morales right hand and got TKO'd for the finish. He just so the fight could have been stopped and it. I don't have a problem with the stoppage, but if it went on, uh, you know, a few more punches, I wouldn't have been mad either. All right, so this fight was really fun. Victor Henry versus uh, Hi- um, uh, Hani uh, Barcelos. That's how you pronounce it. Uh, crazy output from these guys. Look at this. 134 to 181. Just just Henry did not stop, man. He just kept putting... Look at these totals about round by round. 40 to 50, 54 to 40, 58 to 39, and 69 to 55. They increased their output in the last round just incredible what a great fight highly skilled very technical from both guys um they both they were both fast henry fought, found his range a little bit more using good movement um find, avoiding some of those big shots uh the commentary was favoring honey but it, like it the round was super close um oh let's see oh yeah henry had the burst of the shots at the end of the first round and pushed himself out in front i'd probably give a 10-9 to uh to henry a uh, ton of volume in the second round just from both guys, but the pressure from Henry, I think he just put it put him over the top, and he outlanded him. And again, I give him that round two. And then uh, Barcelos kind of started looking fatigued with 2.30 left in the third. So there just there, there were three big shots that Hani landed in the third round, but other than that, man, this was all Henry, all moving forward, and he stepped up on short notice for his first UFC fight. This is a big fucking deal for him. Congratulations, man. Uh, big step up on short notice to fight this guy who's like just recently in the top 15. That's a big deal. Uh, I mean, the judges all gave him all three rounds as well. Incredible fight, incredible fighter. Really cool to see that stepping up. Uh, let's see. Jack Della Madalena versus Pete Rodriguez. Oh, this was a fun fight. Uh, Rodriguez was throwing a ton of hooks. He's got these shorter arms in his, uh, he was putting a lot on his, on his shots, but he also he he carries too much weight for the division. This Rodriguez guy, uh, he's got too much fat on his body, and it's not like he's a little pudgy for this division, which is not good at uh, welter. Is this ba- what it was? This? Welterweight. That's not good at welterweight. You can't be doing that stuff. Um, it's okay if you walk around at your natural weight, but this shouldn't this shouldn't be your natural weight. He could probably go down to lightweight pretty easily just by leaning out. Um. Della was using his jab, landing uh, straight left, the uh, straight left constantly, busting up uh, Rodriguez's nose, and then uh, Della managed to land a big left hook and or a big left hand, and yeah, uh, Rodriguez fell, and just that was the end of the fight. So uh, Tony Gravely versus uh, Sim- Simon Oliveira, yeah, Simon Oliveira, Oliveira. Uh, Oliveira kept spamming guillotines like over and over again. It was very weird. Uh, I mean, Gravely snuck out of the guillotines, and then after the fifth or seventh attempt, like he should have maybe gone with a different approach because 
you know, every single round went to gravelly because of that. He would get a takedown, do a little bit of damage, get caught in a guillotine, and then squirt out of it. And the guillotines got less and less threatening, so kind of stupid. Bad game plan. Too stringent, not willing to flex, not very flexible. Matt, the steamroller Frivola getting the knockout here. Uh, both guys were throwing haymakers, landing on each other. Uh, Frivola landed a few big shots first. Valdez got up and landed a few of his own. But Frivola just kept pushing him back. Dude, there were six knockdowns from this guy. Uh, Frivola got, got a first-round uh, submission and flattened him out and then finally got the stoppage. Uh, it's, there was a fun fight while it lasted, uh, good for Frivola. I, I don't have too much to say on either one of the fighters for right now. Uh, it's good to see Frivola back in the win column, I guess. Uh, Gomez Juarez versus uh, Dimopoulos. Uh, this was interesting. So, Gomez Juarez threw out these... Uh, why is that? No, that's right. Yeah, Silvana Gar. So, she threw this big right hand and put uh, Demopolis on her ass. But then, Demopolis rolls under and goes for an arm bar and starts, sque- like, cranking down on her arm bar and submits her. Like, we're talking about, you know, circa 2009 UFC shit right there. That was... Pretty cool, and it all happened within the last minute of the first, uh, the last, not the last minute of the first round. She dropped her. Oh no, no, she dropped her with three th- three forty five left, and then they rolled around on the ground until the for a minute, and then she got the submission. All right, and for the first fight of the night, uh, ja- Jasmine Jazdavicius. Versus K uh, K Hansen, yeah K Hansen, who is very popular on the Twitters. Uh, Hansen looks strong, but her skills uh, need to improve. She keeps going for takedowns early without really knowing how to finish a takedown and having the skill and the muscle memory back to back it up. Uh, she looked lost on the feet, still couldn't get she couldn't get her takedowns going in the first round. I I don't think she was so far behind in the first round. It just was not it was not a good round for her. Uh, second round, more of the fa- uh, more of the same. Uh, she caught a kick and then put her on the ground, but then she, she ended up getting reversed and got put on her back and then got stood up for inactivity. It wasn't the most exciting fight, but it wasn't a bad fight either. Um, nine, round two was 90% uh, Jez Davisius on top. So easy, win- easy uh, 2018. Uh, third round, though, Hansen was able, you know, to put the pressure on her, uh, outland her, her volume went way up. I mean, she threw, she landed 26, 26 to 14. So she outlanded her by 12 strikes in the, in the third round. I felt like she did more damage in the third round. Just wasn't enough. Uh, the, the one judge who gave all three rounds to Jez Davisius, like, what were you watching? Come on the third round. It's just pay attention, man. All right. That is that. Cool. Um, but up, 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 um. It is not next weekend. It's the weekend after. So, uh, I don't know what we're gonna do next weekend. We'll figure it out. We'll go over a show or something else I've been per- procrastinating about. We'll find something to talk about. Okay, I said I would keep it short. And it's under an hour. <laughs> I spent more time talking about the first fight, uh, the main the main event. Um, one, because it's important both for the division and the UFC, but also, you know, uh, the implications of you can win a f- still win a fight like that in 2022 is uh, kind of bananas to me. I thought we were trying to get rid of that a long time ago with the whole unified rules and all that shit. I, it's still here, guys. You know, you can win a fight by sitting on top. In the last two minutes, it's it's unfortunate that that's the way it is. It shouldn't be that way. You know, uh, we should be counting damage and going for finishes. All right. If you liked all this stuff, if, th- th- what did you think about the fights? Did you like the main event? Is that your cup of tea? Uh, do you think Francis deserves more money? He does. He really does. So the answer is yes. Um, do you think Gon's ever going to get back to the title? Do you think he's going to win a title? Who do you think won, Moreno or Figueredo? Am I off my rocker to think that Moreno won that fight? You know, uh, let me know what you guys think. Uh, please comment down below. Let me know. Uh, let me know if you want 
Uh, if you got a movie that you that you got, or a show that you guys really like and we could talk about, I would love to do another uh, series review like we did with Karate uh, with Cobra Kai. I love talking about that stuff. Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, enjoy the winter time while it's here. I know it's not the most pleasurable time for everybody because it's cold outside and you tend to stay inside, but enjoy it for what it is. It breaks up the monotony of, uh, you know, always having heat and rain. It really does. I know it sounds silly, but it makes you appreciate it more. So um, find something enjoyable to do in the winter. You know, if you're spending more time inside, maybe pick up some board games with the kids. You know, find a TV show that you guys like. Uh, invite some friends over. Have dinner inside. You know, relax, sit down, kind of recuperate, get ready for the rest of the year, that kind of stuff in the summer that's coming up. All right. Uh, please like like the video if you made it this far. Why not? <laughs> really, I mean it that way. Like, if you made it this far, like, just do that, please. Just click the stupid thumbs up button. It's right there. Just click it. Uh, I appreciate it if you would, though. I really would. Um, and please subscribe. I put one of these out every single week. I've been timestamping down below. You can find them. Uh, this will be up on uh, Spotify. So be up on Podbean or wherever else you get your podcast. If you just want the audio version of these going forward, um, although you do want to see my face, Ugh, gross. I don't want to see it either. You guys see this for an hour if you watch this the whole time. Every time I walk by a slightly reflective surface, I see this face for my entire life. Yeah, I'm not happy about it either. All right, guys. Uh, I appreciate y'all. I really do. Thanks for sticking around. Uh, I, know, I know this wasn't the most energetic one for me. It was a little late, but I really do appreciate y'all. Um, I hope you guys have an awesome week. Go kick this week's ass. Um, yeah, I love y'all.